hit record. Hi, hey, Robert. followers. How are you doing? Good to see you. Uh, good to see you as well. So today, viewers and Brad, we're going to be talking about a film called Harvey. Harvey, uh, wow, a film that I hadn't seen in a long, long time, but it's a favorite film of about two or three other friends of mine. A, a good friend has always loved this film. He always talks about it and quotes it quite often. Oh, good. And then another person that I worked with out of the blue kind of said, have you heard of this movie called Harvey? I think it's a movie that a lot of people really love. It's sort of, uh, I'm sure it's a, a favorite film of many, many people. It's a, it's a wonderful mm. film. I hadn't seen it in 20 years, but it's, I think it's one of those films like It's a Wonderful Life yes. that uh, you should watch once a year, <laughs> you know, every so often to, I don't know, to realign your karma or something. I don't know what, or your chakra or something. To realign yourself with some kind of um, what's important in life. Being, what do you think? What do you think about Harvey? What's your general uh, yeah, rela I've, I've, relationship with Harvey? Yeah, I've loved uh, Jimmy Stewart uh, as an actor for many years. And I, I really enjoyed watching his performances in both of those movies, actually, Harvey and It's a Wonderful Life. Oh, yeah. Um, but I love, I've, I've loved Harvey because of the message and the themes in the show. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've, loved, I've loved it because it gives insight into early film and mm -hmm. the way it was staged and kind of how, how they were borrowing kind of theatrical techniques mm -hmm. and you know, very representational. It's, it was, I've, I've, I've loved the film, but as I watched the film, as I've gotten older and times have changed and attitudes about certain things have changed, there are some things in the film that, that kind of stand out to me as being um, good, in good kind of uh, uh, opportunities for us to see how attitudes have changed yeah. from that time period to today. Not that we have to go back and, you know, wipe all that stuff off so we 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 can kind of say it never happened, but rather mm -hmm. acknowledge that it happened and, and treat it for what it is, a good film, but that there are flaws in it from our attitudes today because of our shifting um, shifting thoughts about certain things. But uh, let's talk well, about this film. Let's talk about yeah, Harvey. That still happens today, right? It's, yeah. it's a, it's a it's a common theme even in in film today to or you know both big and small screen right to to set up a, a comedic kind of story that has a challenge of some kind of buffoon like authority um, yeah you know so yeah you know what I it. you know what I discovered last night on YouTube uh, and this is amazing you would never find this if you didn't have YouTube was in 1972, mm. Jimmy Stewart did a remake of Harvey with Helen Hayes playing the uh, Vita character, his aunt or whatever, Vita, and Helen Hayes. And it was it's sort of a TV thing, but they actually worked from the script, the stage play. It's not the film version. It's strictly the stage play. Right. And I watched, oh, maybe the first third or the first less than third of, of it last night, but I didn't watch the entirety. But I, I want to go back and watch it again because it's, um, it's true to the original material. stage material, the original script, the original stage play. Anyway, worth a watch for anyone, for yourself or anyone who wants to see the yeah. stage play version. Uh, I've never seen it performed as a stage play. You were wondering about the the director and the and the the cinematographer and you know the other creative voices that were in the room as they were designing this piece and how mm -hmm. much they might have influenced some of the 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 themes or some of the choices that were being made that represent certain aspects of society at the time but do you think that do you think that those were the 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 ones that had the most influence 
or does it mostly come from the writer, from Mary herself? You know, that's a good question. I don't know because I haven't seen the entirety of the stage play. So I'm not sure where the script completely strays mm. from the film and what was left out, what was added. I don't know. The great scenes in Harvey where he's at the gate and the gate opens and closes and those kinds of things was how was that done on the stage play? Oh, those are those are elements that were probably not there, not there, because yeah. that's the difference between a stage representation of the play. Right. Mm -hmm. You're limited by the kinds of settings that you can recreate and 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 move on and off the stage or, you know, change for the audience's benefit to establish yeah. moments. But film is a little bit different because you have literally the opportunity to cut between place to place, right? Scene to scene. And mm -hmm. you can create with literal act, you know, literal spaces, actual spaces. So it's it's quite a different medium as as you know. But yeah, interestingly enough, the the style of acting and even the staging of the movie, the film, it was so presentational, it was so based on theatrical technique at mm. that time, right? So it was, it's, it's a yeah. transition piece. Yeah. Uh, let's, so Harvey, Jimmy Stewart's film, 1950, this came out. And we'll talk a little bit about where the, the idea for the play came. Mary Chase is the author of the original stage play and she won a pulitzer prize for it so it was yeah. quite renowned in its day as a play i believe it was all over broadway i think it was one of the longest running plays ever on broadway over 35 years so yeah, it ran, a thousand it, a thousand something performances a thousand seven yeah. hundred or some something so pretty, pretty it was very well known and uh, when it was trans, this is Mary Chase, and Mary Chase had written a, has written other plays, and she wrote. I saw that she has written three plays that were um, that were uh, made into films, mm -hmm. and this was her second. So her first movie that was made from one of her plays. The play was called Sorority House, and it was mm -hmm. 1939. And then Harvey was in 1950. And then she made another, they made another movie out of a play she wrote called Bernadine in 1957. So she's only had three of her plays turned into films, but I think she's written many other plays as well. And yeah, I think, I think she, she was quite a prolific writer and her source yeah. material was used for different projects mm -hmm. but none as successful as harvey yeah you know and i and i think i think the 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 film the the the, the play itself and the film their commentaries right about the society in which that's what makes good film it's it's got a you know a dramatic arc or a comedic arc but at, at its core, there's something that the author or the playwright is, you know, trying to, the screenwriter is trying to get at. There's something that is, that is something about society or something about relationships or something about this or that. But there's, there's something intentional there. And I think, I think um, one of the things that I noticed in this play was the commentary, or sorry, in this film was the commentary about uh, relationships, right? And how, how relationships and, and the way people act with and for each other. And I, I, as I was reading about her as well, I noticed that all of her earlier works were about the same kinds of things, about relationships, about um, you know, women who were, who were having challenges in their lives and what they were you know, doing to overcome those. And, you know, makes sense in the 1930s, you know, there was just a, a time for women to move into more kind of expansive roles in, in society in general. And 
you know, and there are still a lot of misogynistic attitudes about, about, um, you know, relationships and, and even in, even in the film, Harvey, you could definitely see that with mm-hmm. the, with the doctor and the nurse and their relationship toward each other. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's still, it's a little outdated, but it's uh, the fact the doctor doesn't recognize that the nurse is fond of him and she want, it seems like she wants to marry him. Uh, and at the end of the film, uh, Elwood P. Dowd, he does kind of get them together. He brings couples together in the movie. Mm-hmm. I think there's a huge lot in the film that kind of puts Elwood in this kind of a holy position. He's almost like the Jesus <laughs> metaphor of a, of a, a savior of some kind, a truth speaker. It's all, it seems like a lot of the films that we, we talk about have these truth speakers in them. Right. That seems to be a, a recurring theme where I'm identifying anyway. Right. And Elwood is kind of like a truth speaker. And maybe he's kind of a Jesus-like character in some ways. Mm-hmm. I don't know how intentional that was on the writer's part, but there's certainly some scenes in the film where Jimmy Stewart is made to look almost saintly in the light and the way that he's lit and so on. It's kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I think that the character is meant to appear, the, the character of, of Elwood is meant to appear very sympathetic and very, you can, you can feel a connection to the character. You can feel a general, genuinely likable, right? Even though, you know, he's presented in a way that's disturbing all the other people around him. Uh, I almost feel the opposite. When he walks into a scene, when Jimmy Stewart walks into a scene and people are fighting and bickering, everyone calms down. And they're kind of like, oh, yes, Elwood. He, in certain parts of the film, he kind of calms everyone down and has this, it's this beatific kind of Jesus-like quality where he calms everyone down and his pleasant way of talking makes everyone feel at ease. And when he leaves, they all start bickering again. Yeah, we, don't, we, we see that transition or that progression toward the middle to end of the film. At the beginning yeah. of the film, all we see is the, is the the panic and the and the the chaos that that even a mention of him, right? Yeah. In the early scenes causes people to get frustrated and upset and concerned and worried and anxious, and yeah. we we see that change. But I I, I again I, I I wonder if the the author is or the playwright Mary Chase was intending that to be the focus if if she was making a commentary about society and about you know people in general i don't know i'd have to do more i have to do a lot of research to come to that answer but maybe i don't know there's i wrote i saw that there was an entire book written about mary chase and the writing of harvey uh and it's called pulling harvey out of a hat and it looked like an interesting read to see where she was. It took two years for the play to be written. Or yeah, it took, it took a while the, for it to, the, the to, movie to be written. Yeah. And it went through several drafts. And yeah. at one time, the main character was a girl. And another time... Oh, I the, didn't know that. The, 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 the rabbit was... One of the stagings, the, the rabbit was supposed to be present, um, hmm. you know, in the film giant giant rabbit uh, acting uh you know an actor inside mm-hmm. a rabbit suit um and i think it was once i think i read that at one time the rabbit was a parakeet a giant parakeet right so it's gone through it went through many revisions and many permutations to get to what we eventually have on film right let's move ahead on this picture this is the only artwork that I could find relating to the Broadway production of Harvey, Mm -hmm. picture of the original actor who played uh, Elwood P. Dowd. His name was Faye. Mm -hmm. And this is the actress, I think it might be the same actress that portrayed Harvey in the, uh, portrayed Aunt Vida in the movie. 
I think her name was Hull. What was her name? Oh yeah, Josephine Hull. Josephine Hull. I think she may, I don't know, I'd have to do more research on that, but I think she may have been in the stage play as well as the movie. But I'm not 100%. She definitely sure. had some had a theatrical presence. Yeah. When she was when she was on on screen. Here's Frank. This is Frank Fay. He played the original character of Elwood P. Dowd in the mm. Broadway production. I had never heard of Frank Fay. A uh, big Broadway actor, obviously, but uh, he may have done some film work, but I'm not too familiar with his film work. I hadn't heard of him. Yeah, but neither am I. The story that I heard, here's Frank Fay with Jimmy Stewart. The story that I read was that Frank had to take a leave of absence for a month or something, and Jimmy Stewart filled in for him on Broadway. It could have been a week, could have been a month. I'm not sure that how much time. Mm -hmm. And then after Frank came back, then it was thought of that maybe Jimmy Stewart should play this role on the stage in London. And he oh. went he went to London and he I think he performed the play in London for six months. Mm. This is all prior to the movie. Yeah. Right. And uh, so he really got to know the, the role well. And I'm not sure if that's where he met Josephine Hull or if she was maybe she was a Brit. She seems like she's British. Maybe maybe he worked with her in England or in London, maybe not in New York. I don't know. But the play was going on on two continents for a while. Uh, so that's interesting connection to uh, how Jimmy Stewart got involved. These are early uh, stills for the movie. And I think they're horrible, this yeah. <laughs> ugly rabbit. Yeah. And the, f the yeah. fact that they even entertained the idea that they were going to show a rabbit, show the rabbit, show Harvey yeah. is like unthinkable. But apparently they did. And I believe this was done for the film. And here's another picture of Josephine Hull with her <laughs> Oscar. She won an yeah. Oscar for her performance uh, supporting actor role. And here she is with a, a giant hideous rabbit. She was very entertaining. Very. She was great. She was great. Yeah, she was fantastic. This is the director of the film. His name is Henry Coster. He, you know, of all the research I did, his story was the most interesting, I thought. He was directing films in Germany, born in Berlin. He did three or four films in Germany just prior to World War II. He got out of Germany. There's a story I read somewhere where he was in a bank and there was a Nazi in the bank and he punched the Nazi and knocked him out. Now, I don't know the, how true those, that story is, but great for the movie. If you do a biopic on Henry Coster, I think that would be a great scene to add in. <laughs> um, so then he, he did some films in Austria and Italian production, still in Europe, but then he finally went to the United States and started making films there. And this is The Bishop's Wife. This one was directed in what year? 1947 he i think his first u.s film was 1936 so he got out of germany pretty early but this is 1947 Cary grant he worked with a lot of big big names this is uh, a film he did in 1952 and it Apparently, it was one of the first film roles that Richard Burton ever did. So he's worked with Cary Grant, Richard Burton, a lot of big names. This is a film he did, oh, Richard Burton again, called The Robe. And this was done in 1953. This is, I guess, after Harvey, 1953. This is a film he did with Marlon Brando, 1954. This is another film with Jimmy Stewart done in the 60s, I think. Did this one? This is and this is one of his last films with Debbie Reynolds as the singing nun. Mm. And I guess this was sort of what inspired. I'm thinking this is what inspired that TV series, The Flying Nun. Right. I don't know why I think that, because it's it looks similar, but maybe it didn't. But it just seems like the flying nun came out of this out of this. The singing I mean, nun. He was quite prolific and he worked with some pretty 
pretty oh. big names. Yeah. I knew nothing about his career. It's an interesting career. When he got to America, apparently he didn't speak any English. He had to learn how to speak English and became a, a pretty renowned director, although not a household name in terms of right. directors. But I'd like to go back and see some of his work. Some of his mm -hmm. films seem kind of like some of them do have that a bit of a cheese in there. The cheese factor seems pretty heavy in these later films, but his right. earlier films seem kind of interesting. Well, but that's kind of an element of the era as well. Yeah. Right? Big budget films with big name actors in the, in the fifties and sixties and even early seventies had a very, very cheesy kind of, style to them mm -hmm. in terms of the stories they were trying to tell very yeah. few very few really push the boundaries like we would we would have we would have some um you know like tv made for tv movies that what we would call kind of you know cheesy ending cheesy very predictable kind yeah. of formulaic yeah uh, method or very formulaic style or 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 approach to the story and um that that made for tv kind of model came from those early 60s and 70s late 50s early 60s 70s movies that kind of movement from the big screen to the small screen yeah i was certainly making the big studio type films that are he was not he was not an independent filmmaker certainly had a great career interesting guy and so that was his last film, 1966. Oh, there's another one. This is from 1961, Flower yeah. Drum Song. This was a play. This was a stage play too. Yeah. Broadway's most joyous hit lights up the, the screen. So he was, he was kind of uh, popular for taking stage plays and, and reworking them for the screen. So this one, Flower Drum Song, I remember this was a... Uh, play that my mother went and saw in San Francisco because I remember we used to have the the program for flower drum song in our house with our books and I used to look at it as a kid I don't know where it is anymore it could be around here somewhere but uh it was a play that that was really popular because it came to San Francisco it was playing here for a while too seems like a it would be a fun a fun um kind of project, right? To take a look at the filmography of, of a director or of an actor or of a cinematographer. Oh yeah. And just study, just watch each of their films and watch as they're in chronological order and watch to see if there's any progression in the way they, they do their job. If, if yeah. there's been growth or, you know, it'd just be fun to do. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've bought a few of those box sets of a director before and uh, because some of these films are hard to find mm -hmm. and you can't find them unless you buy a box set sometimes. And I, uh, I enjoy exploring one director's work. I'm not sure how his work is overall. I don't know if, if Harvey was his peak, but I think some of these other films were, were pretty big successes as well. Uh, it'd be fun to explore his work. So Henry Coster, interesting guy, <clears throat> the director behind Harvey. So let's talk about the movie Harvey. It has a bit of a history. It... This, you know, it's funny. Uh, you put this picture up. Yeah. And I, I just mentioned uh, to uh, my wife yesterday that I've only now noticed the um, the hitching post. Yeah, picture, and um, you know, with with all of the concerns that we're having about uh, representation of of racial identity in film and television uh, lately, and you know how it's how it you know has changed over the years, but more specifically about the attitudes people are having today about it. I never noticed before. And that's, I guess, a comment about me, but it's also, you know, in, in my progress, but also an indication of the attitudes of the time. 
right? When yeah. this film was made. So if you were uh, if you were someone who uh, who couldn't afford having your own stable boy, you were able to uh, buy a statue out front that would be your <laughs> your fake stable boy, so you could tie your horse to it. But horses at this point, I don't know what period the film is set in. It's it. It was done in 1950, like but it, maybe the 40s horses were already on the way out or gone. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this is kind of an affectation of an earlier time. But certainly, yes, I mean, the black face and the, the character representation of an African-American stable boy is, is something you don't see anymore. It could also be an, a, a hint about the lingering old world attitudes about things mm. right so even in this film right mental health issues or mental health attitudes are core to you know the, the film itself or the, the the play itself but maybe this is a visual cue about the change of attitudes or the way things have changed over time i think actually what i believe when i see this is i think it has to do with showing that Elwood P. Dowd comes from a moneyed family mm -hmm. because he does have cash. And uh, I couldn't help but think about the, uh, the similar themes involved that we uh, talked about in the movie Parasite before, <laughs> mm -hmm. that people were after his money. Right. Uh, his, his aunt, his niece were certainly... Um, concerned about losing Elwood's, uh, you know, bank account, because he was the, he, I guess, was sitting on some money. And so he having the status. The, yeah, he had the status and, but I think he had deep pockets too. So the, uh, the stable boy statue kind of maybe represents his affluence. That's how I see it. His name is there, Dowd, the family name, his family probably had horses hitched up there in the past, but now horses are gone, but it's still a, it's a relic of that, those bygone years. Right. That when his family was perhaps more well-to-do, but he still had some money. This is Josephine Hull. The, she played the character of uh, Elwood's aunt. And, uh, what I thought was so funny when, when she came back from being accosted at the, at the rest home, what do we call it? We don't, we can't call it a nut house because that would be incorrect, but it's referred to as a nut house in the movie by one of the characters, <laughs> the Chumley like psychiatric hospital, psychiatric hospital. Thank you, Brad, for keeping me on online there. But she, this was a bit of the, thing that were the 1950s 1940s i would say freudian psychology was probably just bubbling under the you know the current maybe popularly and the fact that she's making a comment about the um the psychiatric psychiatric hospital she had to spend some time in <laughs> and how they want to talk about sex surges and all that filthy stuff there's a lot of distrust of psychiatry portrayed in the film which i am was very interesting uh, yeah the you know. the the way that they looked to the doctors to do in the film the the sister and the the daughter and even the judge right they look to the doctor for as authority about things yeah and as as the final you know arbiter of of mental health sane or insane right wrong good bad you know and yet they have this attitude about the kinds of work that the doctor yeah or the psychiatrist does there's a duality you know, to their attitudes that you know, one's hidden and one's, one's, one's the outward facing and one's the true inward facing, right? The yeah. repressed attitudes about things or the repressed, this, this line in particular spoke to 
kind of the the stuff that's hidden the stuff that's underneath and yeah i mean her attitudes about sex right yeah. for the time was quite prevalent but would we call that a healthy attitude today would we say right. that was a healthy attitude uh good mental health probably not yeah i don't know you know you brought up a point that i kind of feel like they were just using this psychiatric hospital as a way to get to get elwood out of the way obviously mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. also just to make their life easier they didn't want to have to deal with elwood's delusions or whatever you want to call it is it a delusion is it a gift is it sainthood whatever mm. he has that uh they didn't like that disrupted their life they were they just saw the hospital i don't know if they had a i don't know if they had an elevated position and trusted the doctors i just saw them seeing it as a mechanism to get elwood out of the way you know that's well, yes. how i see it but they had to play the game with the doctor right yeah they couldn't you know, they had to they had to listen and and take their advice and you know try to present the information in in the script anyway in, in the film anyway um she doesn't go and just arbitrarily say i want to have my my brother committed right she has to play the game and she has to take and listen to what they had to say so oh, she basically says no i want him out i want him committed he's got to go away that's what i saw when she phones up the lawyer and says, oh, yeah, we've got to have Elwood sent away. Sure, yes, but but that's not what she says to the doctor. Hmm. She, didn't, she has to, she goes in and, and works with the authority and, and, you know, gives the information that's necessary to convince them. But, right. yeah, with the, with the judge, definitely. She just says, I, I need him out. I need him gone. Yeah. Right. And it's a way, again, that parasite parallel it's a way for her to have him out of the picture, but still have his money, you know, <laughs> have him committed and then be in charge of the, of the, of the Elwood, the Dowd fortune. And the fact that they treated it so matter of factly, just, I mean, the way yeah. they presented this, it's humorous. It's, it's yeah. kind of like, this is the way it is. And, you know, no big deal is kind of an indication of the attitudes of the time. Yeah, and the fact that they misidentify her as the patient, you know, it's like very random. It's very, <laughs> you know, what kind of, there's no thorough uh, research here. Yeah. He, here's the doctor, Dr. Chumley. And Dr. Chumley is the main authority figure, I guess, in the, in the hospital in the psychiatric ward or whatever we want to call this place. And uh, he's the one who is converted over into Elwood's way of thinking about Harvey, which is very interesting. It's in a way kind of subversive uh, how he falls under the sway of Harvey along with Jimmy Stewart's character, right? From a, from a staging perspective, right, from the the way the off the off the the filmmaker uh, creates the character or introduces the character is behind a locked door or he's behind a closed door when you go in he's behind a big desk he's surrounded by books he's very knowledgeable and it's very clear that he's the authority the way he speaks with others and he's very clipped and matter of fact and he's the stodgy kind of um, uh, wise older man who has yeah. got all the knowledge and all the information, all the experience. Right. And who never sees anybody. Right. He has no, right. yeah. For 15 years, all he's done is manage the place and presumably write papers and, you know, consult with people, but he never sees anybody, which, yeah. you know, again, is, is kind of a, an interesting, symbolically, it's an yeah. interesting uh, approach to take for, a comment about about the society itself and about maybe psychiatry maybe about medical practice but doesn't know. doesn't harvey make dr chumley a better man when dr chumley gives in to his his dreams his hopes his own inner feelings he's elevated he's brought up 
he before he was living this one dimensional cut off world. Yes. But the gift of Harvey elevates him and makes him fully human in touch with and decides he wants to, I don't know what he wants to do, travel the world. He wants to do what he's always wanted to do and make some reach for his dreams. It's the you know? difference between the external facing, you know, the mask that you share, that you present out and yeah. the inner, the inner life, the inner truths. He says to Dowd, right? To uh, um, Elwood. Elwood, thank you. Yeah. He says to Elwood, um at one point right i'll something i've never told anybody else before right right so when he's allowed when he allows himself to let out that internal the stuff that he's been hiding from everybody right and it seems ridiculous right that he mm -hmm. wants to just sit and listen to someone say uh you poor boy you're poor boy you're poor man or you know whatever it is that he says um it's it, that's what is the beginning of the transition, right? The transformation of this character from that stodgy kind of behind closed doors. He becomes a better person, right? or at least that's the implication that he's heading in that direction. There's a great shot and I don't have it next. I think, let's see. Well, there's the actual, uh, the Chumley rest or whatever they call it. Rest home, Chumley rest home. I think it's called. Uh, but there's a great shot that I'll I have later, where you see the Dr. Chumley laying on his psychiatrist couch, and That's El Elwood is on the chair, yeah. kind of the uh, role reversal, right? There's a role reversal there, which is kind of cool. I thought this was great. the The bars go across. You see this beautiful place, and the bars go across, and it's like a prison. You know, you're reminded. Yeah. This beautiful, restful place is really a prison. You know, you can't get out. <laughs> and even and Elwood in the in the in the movie himself talks about the marvel of the gate moving, yeah. opening, and closing, mechanical, right? So yeah. it's it's the mechanical marvel. But mechanical marvels are you know quite quite rigid and restricted. These things that are being done and and I. I wonder if that again is there's I mean there's no reason to have it in the film. There's nothing that 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 it it supports in the film other than behind behind a gate, separated from that whole idea of mechanical opening and closing must be some comment about the rigidity of the of the time. Yeah, or the institution, this kind of an institution that locks people up so haphazardly in a way you know it i mean it just seems like back then in the 50s and 40s psychiatry was uh maybe in its infancy and think, not not diagnosing people well and there's that that whole thing about giving elwood the injection of what is it formula 977 and that's going to take yeah. away all his delusions right. and he's going to be um He's going to be cured and then that we can talk about the speech that the taxi driver does to kind of kind yeah, of that, that's a beautiful that's, moment yeah it's a nice moment um you know the 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 dr robertson i think his name was right the character yeah, right um he he says of of was it avita what was the name of the uh, the, the aunt the, Her name yeah. Vita, just Vita. Vita, right? Yeah. He says of well, after Vita comes in to talk with him about about uh, Elwood, um, he has her committed because right. he says she is the delusional one, right? Because of what she's ranting about, and it's the oldest dodge in the book. He calls it right. Right. So right. is it a, is it a commentary about psychiatry sees sees you know lunacy in everybody? Right. Psychiatry good. suspects everyone. Everyone's a possible uh, psychopath. Or, right. Or maybe everybody <laughs> is psychopathic and and it seems ridiculous to, to lock up, you know, people for just some general kind of craziness. Well, this particular shot I put in, which is just because I was very interested in how the attack this first taxi driver uh 
when yeah. Elwood starts talking to Harvey in the cab, he pulls out a wrench and yeah. he takes this wrench out like he's going to protect himself. There's a lot of fear yeah. about uh, people with mental health issues that you're going to get killed, you're going to get attacked, you're going to be murdered, which uh, I don't know. I mean, I don't know enough about psychiatry to know what percentage of people with mental health problems are violent. But anyone who has anything that deviates from the norm is under suspect and treated yeah. as a dangerous character. And right. he pulls out this wrench. It's like, whoa. <laughs> it was it was for comedic effect yeah but at the same time it was it seemed a little bit over over the top but it also is about the attitudes of the time yeah that was right? very telling something it's a little it's a little bit off you definitely have to lock it away as as indicated by that by that you know fence and and yeah. gate or you have to you know, protect yourself, keep them, keep them at bay, separate yourself, be ready to, you know, attack, hit somebody, defend. In the head. <laughs> yeah, bust yeah. some heads up. So here's now, this is the first tangible evidence, I believe, that we see is the hat with the two holes. Right. And this is when you, and there's a, quite a few of these sprinkled throughout but when dr chumley discovers this hat when he i guess he picks it up he thinks it's his own hat and he finds his hat with two holes two ear holes cut in it uh that's when you start to wonder what is going on is harvey real is harvey not real what's the story how did this hat get there um the film has that great quality where it just, what do they call, I guess the, maybe like the suspension of disbelief. It's a sort of, it allows you to uh, be drawn into this fantasy. And it's, it's, some, it, it's, it's paced very well. Yeah. It moves at a very interesting pace in all of the, all of the moments. And that has to do with the, with the playwright or the, you know, the, the screenwriter, Mary Chase. Mm -hmm. But it ha but it really is um, structured very nicely so that there are moments like this where they're the two doctors are confronting each other about you know what's going on and and who's who's really the crazy one in this you know where does this hat come from and 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 who is it that's that's that should be committed right yeah. so I I like the moments and I like the pace of the show for those opportunities that they you they, they they take to kind of have that conflict between those characters. Yeah, I think it was very a very excellent you know structure. This play had a great structure, which is why I'm interested in seeing the real stage play. Yeah. To see what was changed, what was added uh, you know from the stage play into the movie, but I think the movie did a great job translating from the stage to the uh to the screen it's very well done the, the 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 actor who played uh, the dr chumley right yeah really good really oh good. he was great yeah the actor who played dr robertson terrible yeah he was a bit stiff he was kind of a very yeah, static a bit, very one-dimensional yeah very a little bit cardboard but he wasn't a main actor and even I don't as think... a stage actor, I would have found I would yeah. have found his 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 performance quite wooden. Yeah, I would say that was probably right. I I kind of agree. This guy was great. He was great. Jesse White, I believe he was in the stage play on Broadway. Because I think I saw a still of him making a career out of that out of that role. That would be pretty amazing. Yeah, but uh, fun character. Yeah, Jesse White. He became the famous Maytag repairman. I don't know if you remember yep. those commercials. Remember the and he's done other films as well. I can't think of any, but this is definitely his career-defining role. This kind of 
kind of brash, tough talking, wise guy kind of an attitude, you know. Yeah, I, again, each of the male characters had some quality. I mean, in, in, and the women characters as well, right? But they're indicative of the time and of the characters, of, of rather of the gender um, identities or the gender attitudes right, of that time. And I found that he, while he was likable, he had added, he had, he had a manner about him that was about how men maybe treated or spoke to or engaged with women, and yeah. how a guy in in this situation, right? He's an orderly at a psychiatric hospital. Mm-hmm. Um, even he, the, way he, the way he treated the patients was suspect, right? Oh, Again, yeah. through our eyes, but. Of if we look, if we use this as like a time capsule to give us a hint, while dr- dramatized, of course, right, uh, to give us a hint about the attitudes of the time, they were quite, they were quite unusual, right, for for uh, us. They, we would not have, exp- we would not tolerate that kind of thing. Oh no, I I, I don't know right. if he was likable to anyone. He was just a disagreeable guy, and he was. I think there was one point where he. Uh, Aunt Vita is there at the table with the nurse and he walks up and goes, we've got a trouble with this lunatic upstairs. I can't get him a bath. He's driving me nuts. He's crazy. This screwball, you know, whatever he says. Yeah. And then the nurse goes, well, this is his uh, aunt. Oh, oh, hi. Nice to meet you. Oh yeah. He's a lovely man. He's like totally turns right. on a dime. Yeah. But uh, no, he was, to me, he was the naked face of, or the re- naked representation of this horrible attitude towards mental health, a t- lack of compassion, lack of empathy. Uh, and, f- and he actually works in a mental health institution, you know, it's like, he was well, pretty yeah, the, horrible, the, 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 <laughs> but, but right. all for comedic effect, of course, it's all done for comedic effect, but yeah, I, I I liked I liked the character not because of the attitudes they had, yeah. that 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 the character was given, but rather because he represented the average Joe, right? Yeah, he 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 was just the working guy and he was doing his job. Yeah, and maybe he went at it a little bit with a little bit too much gusto for, you know, for the mistreatment of people, but yeah. that's the average Joe, not like the taxi driver, the one you know the one scene the taxi driver was in, right? was likable right. you know a good character but but there was nothing at least this character was multi-dimensional right so that's what i that's why i thought he was a likable character you saw him both at his worst but you also saw him at his best i didn't like this character he was awful okay. <laughs> he was this guy's got nothing good going for him he's a right. schmuck he's a right. dude. he's terrible okay <laughs> look what's the matter you goofy too you a member of this cockeyed family? He's like, okay, he's, I don't know if I've ever saw his good side throughout the entire movie. He does fall in love or whatever we want to call it with uh, Elwood's niece. Uh, but that there could was, be, a, again, I see a paras, parasite parallel here. Yeah, he's there, he's there. moving in on a wealthy family. He sees her as the heir to this beautiful home okay all right i didn't i <laughs> didn't quite conniving. see that in the character i didn't no i didn't see that in the character i saw a lecherous okay. character i saw lecherous yeah all right I but saw i that. didn't i didn't see i didn't see that part of 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 the money grubbing kind of you know <laughs> taking advantage <laughs> kind of uh, guy he was he was a man he finally saw a woman who was attractive and and Went for uh, it. you know and and she showed some interest so he showed some interest and she was desperate for anyone yeah that but, you got to be desperate to settle for this guy come on <laughs> <laughs> and you definitely saw that in there in that exchange they had right um but there's um the gender relationship right the way the 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 way these two characters spoke in this particular scene you know, he gets really close to her at one point. She's up against the wall at one point, right? Yeah. But she doesn't, looks like she's, she, she has opportunity to pull away, but she doesn't, mm-hmm. right? It's like, there's this, there's this 
style or this manner that they had with each other in this era that that again we would see it as a little bit creepy and a little bit icky uh you know and not acceptable today but back then that's how they interacted with each other but at the same time you know back then if a woman didn't like those advances you know she she might have just you know found a way to you know get away from that situation well she was so again she was so desperate but her her mother aunt vita uh recognizes what's his character's name wilson jesse white's character wilson she recognizes him as being a lech and a a kind of a shark and it's like stay away from him stay away from him no, he's all no she, she does not she recognize does too him as that. she sees him as the underclass she yes. sees him as it's a beneath social... her definitely beneath her status right, not, a lecture, not, not somebody who's interested in the money but oh. she wants to set her daughter up with somebody from high society right. right somebody from a good family from this guy is just an average everyday guy well, she has and Vita doesn't wants, want her daughter with that guy. Yeah, that's well, well, yeah, that's probably the other reason too. She doesn't want this guy in there at all. He's he's out for the money, he's out for the nookie, oh. he's out for everything. Get her out. I didn't I didn't get that whole money thing at all. Okay, you didn't get the I money thought thing. he was just I, I, I have completely. to go back and watch it again to get that, but there has well, to be need a, to. You might I might need, need to rewatch this a third time. You may be you, you may be stuck on the parasite <laughs> kind of thing a little bit too much. This is a capitalist parable. This is about the evils of capitalism and greed no, and social no. climbing. This is what it's about. I, don't, I think that theme is there, but I don't <laughs> think the film Central Tenet is about the evils of social climbing and capitalism. I don't think that has. This much is a to critique do. of the capitalist system. No. Yes, no, it think, is. I, I think you're off on a <laughs> you're off a very very thin branch on there on on the tree there, but I'd like you to beat my invisible friend Carl. That's Carl, right. <laughs> Carl Marks. He's right here. Hi, Carl. Right. Tell Brad what's up. Okay, let's go. <laughs> I don't know what this has to do. After we came back, mother had died. That's depressing. Well, this is this is and this is the well, the telling. Um, that is of, a telling scene because that is what Elwood's maybe so he Harvey was... Harvey uh, affliction or whatever you call it his creation of harvey came about after his mother passed away and this is what society would have would have thought right this is what psychiatry would have thought right at a traumatic moment and he mentions Mm it yeah the dr robinson mentions trauma right so this moment would have been recognized by the audience as a traumatic moment difficult moment when somebody has uh you know some difficulties dealing with reality so People, I think, in the audience would have recognized that. Yeah. And there's another one. Is that all those doctors do in places like that? Think about sex. I think that has to do trickling down from the Freudy ideas of Freud that must have been coming into popular culture at the time, where Freud is all about sex. Everything's about sex, 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 sex. Yeah, but but we also can't forget that in the 40s and 50s, they still had quite a, a, a I wouldn't say puritanical, but they had a repressed um, attitude about public displays or public conversations or conversations with, with, with anybody uh, pertaining to sexuality. So that's just another indictment of what society was like back then. Particularly yeah, but the I mean, class. there were, yeah, in the upper class, in certain pockets of society, the her social and her social class, yes. But there were other papers where, hey, the roaring 20s, man, whoop, whoopie do and all that stuff. I mean, there was a lot of uh, frivolity and um, gaiety going on. True, but then the, the economy crashed and yeah, the, you know, the collapse, the, the moral collapse of society and yeah. the 1930s and the Great Depression and the return of kind of a, a moralistic kind of yeah. holier than thou attitude about life in general. Yeah. And they survived the war. And this is, you know, post-war America. This is where, you know, things have have taken a bit of a 
more restricted turn. Perhaps, yeah. The um, and the mention of alcohol and overuse of alcohol was brought up quite a few times about Elwood being a drunk, perhaps who yeah. drinks too much and imagines these things because of his drinking. Yeah, that was brought up here and there. Although a lot it wasn't of impression a, in these three characters. A lot of judgment, suspicion, mm -hmm. paranoia, worry about what other people think that with, you know, that maintaining that social facade of, I mean, I think of one of my favorite movies, which is Ordinary People. Right. Uh, Mary Tyler Moore's character is kind of the same lineage as Aunt Vita, where she's ashamed of psychiatry ashamed of what the neighbors and the relatives think uh if anyone in her family has any kind of mental health problem there's a lot of shame it's the shame issues that you know yeah, because uh, it's the outward facing it's 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 how they how the family is perceived by others you know what yeah they, what they put out there right yeah it's the facade of social kind of normalcy yeah it was interesting, interesting in this scene, in this scene, I don't know if you have a picture of it, but in this scene, um, Vita says, you, you know, um, why can't they just go for long walks and, and, you know, get out their, you know, whatever their, 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 their thoughts or by, you know, going on long walks. And I think the daughter turns um, to the judge one of the funniest lines the judge ever utters, right, is something about, um, I don't recall or something when she was asked, do you go for long walks, doctor? And he changes the subject. Because <laughs> if he says he goes on long walks, that it, means he has issues that he's focusing on sex a lot, right? A long walk is a distraction from that. Right. right? So it, it's and it's also quite interesting that sex pops up many times in this film mm -hmm. you know sexuality sexual relation sexual tension sexual interest and attraction that they pop up frequently and yeah. i i wonder if that's because as many psychiatrists in early years often thought that sex had a lot to do with the mental illnesses that people were having you know i think in the 40s when psychiatry was starting to take hold, I think open, frank discussions of sex and sexuality were more common. And I think in my view, and I don't know, I've never read the book about how Mary Chase wrote the screen, the stage play, but I think she was a progressive woman from what I read. And she was probably well aware of, the, of how society buries sexuality. Well, and and this is her way of was based on Freud's theories anyway. Yeah. You don't think psychiatry was based on Freud? I think early psychiatry was based on Freud's theories about yeah. sexual repression and the edible complex. And, you know, it, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that maybe upper society would not have wanted to want, you know, not wanted to be associated with. I think, I mean, I think her, Irish Catholic background, she was in some ways poking fun at, well, she was not born of a wealthy family. She was, uh, Mary Chase was born into a very poor family. Yeah. And, uh, but I think there was a, still a strict moral code in her upbringing. That, if, um, if she was born into a, a, a Catholic family, then absolutely. Yeah. And so some of this was her way of of examining that, poking fun at it, and uh, maybe pointing up some of the hypocrisy. Yep, I think which is where the, where the humor comes from. Those are the issues that that she's dealing with, and it's not a capital indictment of capitalism at all, but rather indictment of the mental health profession of the time and society's attitudes uh, about relationships and sexuality, and you know, yada yada yada. Yeah, there's capitalism in there too. Come on, let's face it. <laughs> i'm gonna do a marxist critique of every film we watch that's it all right that's well, it I'm, I'm gonna <laughs> bring, it bring it on bring it on 
I'm trying to spark a little, uh, you know, conflict here, Brad. Conflict is hey, the is the uh, main element to, needed in drama. A thin branch, you go right ahead. <laughs> what? Mar a communism, Marxism. I'm on that thin branch, clinging for dear life. Thank you. Elwood is the friend to all people, yeah. the lowest to the highest, and he treats everyone the same way. And this is the man in the bar he meets that was a, he's a former convict who just got out of prison, right. sitting by himself, lonely. Elwood shakes his hand, talks to him, and is a nice person with him. It's like, that's that Christ-like element of him that is just he's a friend to all yeah and he just radiates happiness and when he comes near you you start to you start to beam he makes people beam and it's a beautiful thing to see jimmy stewart navigate through this film with all these strange characters and nothing gets to him you know what i mean that's i know the, what you mean the saintly vita, character vita's Vita is the foil to Jimmy Stewart. Vita's interest is in other people from her society or from her from her social circle that can help her with her daughter. That's how we see Vita in the initial part of that. And all of her all of her interactions are all about her shame at having her brother Elwood and the way he is, his quirkiness, right? And so what does it say about the family and all that? But Elwood, um, he he doesn't he doesn't as you said he doesn't see people that way, and he invites people to his home, yeah. right? Brings them in to you know, for for meals for for food, and his interest in people is not about what he can get from them, but rather what he they can do you know in conversation with each other. Yeah. Um, he's yeah, I think Vita's commentary about the 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 people who hang out in bars and the people that Elwood hangs out with. She says a couple times that these people are you know riffraff and you know beneath her, but Elwood treats them like they're not. And I think that's the that's the one of the core. I guess I would say it's one of the the core the things that I like most about the care not like most, but it's one of the things I like uh, about the character is his treatment of others and particularly Jimmy Stewart and how he has that manner of, of engaging and, and kind of creating this bond between other actors. He's a very generous actor. Jimmy Stewart is a very generous actor when yeah. you watch him either, either in, in this film or others. He gives and he gives and he gives. But of course, it translates to the audience as well, because we get to see exactly what he's feeling, exactly what the character is thinking. Yeah. Anyway, but, sorry, I went off. Yeah, you know, he reaches, he reaches beyond, he doesn't see people in a class structure. He doesn't recognize you as being wealthy, you as being poor, you as being disadvantaged. He, everyone he meets, is, he meets them as a fellow human. And it's a beautiful thing. And I think we should all aspire to be Elwoods in our own lives. And I think the world would be a better place if we all were a little bit more like Elwood P. Dowd. And that's, I think the big takeaway of the film is just the inspiration. This film realigns you with, uh, with that. Oh yeah, you've got the screwiest uncle that ever stuck his puss inside our nut house. I mean, that guy... <laughs> I don't see anything redeeming in this character, Wilson, whatsoever. He I, is exactly what he is. He's, he's exactly horrible. What, he's exactly what he is. Horrible. He's, exactly, <laughs> he, he's, does, he's not pretending to be anything other than he is. He's biased. He works in a mental health institution yeah, I, and he he's, treats he's, people his like that. About it, his attitude about it is, is yes, it's not okay. But <laughs> Great. come on. Okay, yeah. Right, but he, he's not pretending to be something that he's not, which is, which is charming. Yeah, he's not mind. a fake. That's true. He's not fake. Well, he is fake. Sometimes he can be fake. Yeah, but that's a mask he puts on for his book, right? That's that's. <laughs> really good. Anyway, horrible character. Awful. <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> 
He's the most Karl Marxist character that you he's could, the, could. He's not. He's the least Karl Marx. This guy's no. judgmental. He's not accepting of other uh, people. He's intolerant. He's he treats him. Look, look. He's not putting a mask on in front of her. Yeah, because he wants her get in her panties. He's honest on. with her. <laughs> right. He's honest with her. He doesn't want. He, he, he's yeah. he's he's not into the capitalist thing there. That's for sure. That's what love can do. Love can bring out your better, higher nature. There you go. Or is it lust? I'm not sure what this guy's after. But he's after the money. My God, there's a grand piano in that house. Next. <laughs> okay. Always used by a cunning type of psychopath, even behind closed doors, even though Dr. Sanderson's door isn't closed there. They treat patients behind their back with disdain and and uh you know disrespect he's basically saying that the woman was a cunning type of psychopath the aunt vita it's just kind of shocking when you see the behind the scenes of uh, in this mental health institution yeah there's it's a commentary for sure about the institution about the structure of psychiatry and medicine yeah and and how it um, treats its patients or, or the people that that need it for sure and while that there is that commentary going on the the this these scenes with these two characters are more about gender relations it's about how one character treats another how the woman must be subservient and if everything that's wrong no matter who makes the error is hers she tries to be you know, uh, it's my fault. I did it. It's my mistake. Tries to, you know, be caring and 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 nurturing, but the man, right? He's accusatory and and dismissive and and insulting. It's it is a it is an atrocious um, type of relationship that these two people have. And it's it, either you know the the men the the two men in this film that are dealing with women are basically made out to be horrible people. Yeah. He's horrible. Wilson's horrible. Uh, controlling. El yeah. Controlling. Not, Wilson dismissive. Is not, Wilson is not horrible. <laughs> we can agree to disagree, but you're wrong. Um, yeah. But he's bad too. And she's trying to bag a doctor but she's the most innocent. Sorry, are you saying she's being manipulative? And she's no, she's to... not. She's not. She's that, that she's... is the most dismissive. <laughs> Robert, no, I, I, I am. She this wants. One... She wants the doctor to recognize her, and see that she has admiration and love for him. I guess. Um, we find out later that they've danced before. Oh. We find out later in the film that they have had a relationship. They are, this is not the first time that mm. they're having this conversation or a conversation that there's been some affection in the past, okay. right? And for whatever reason, he's being a total jerk. Yeah, he is being a total right? jerk. I mean, so, the men being portrayed this way in the film uh, is kind of interesting coming from a female uh, writer, you know, kind of cool, kind of cool to see. A female but, so why why does she write the man the men this way because it's a realistic depiction of the male character of the time of the era well yeah but we still right. have a lot of jerks around today too come on we haven't yeah true but you think... would but you would admit though that the representation of men in society um that is most most appealing and most uh well received is one that is more sensitive and more appreciative of the, the women and less misogynistic you would agree with that yeah i mean i think you're right at the I time think... in the 50s that was not the case yeah the pendulum but i mean on the other side but i still think you know she's calling out these these guys for what they are you know true and do you think do you think that this is slightly you know elevated do you think this is a kind of a, 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 a caricature of men that this doctor is, you know, it's like 
emphasize, his negative qualities are emphasized more? Or do you think this is an actual true depiction of the way the man was or men were at that time? Mm, that's a good question. I think of all the characters in the film, I would say these two characters are probably the most realistic in a way. Do you know what I mean? I think they probably are the most accurate representation, although I think there's still a character, uh, you know. You think these two are the most accurate? Wow. So who do you think are the most accurate? I mean, it's certainly that's the not. Second, that's the second thin branch you've walked out on. Don't you think, do you think this is just a complete, these two characters are just like cartoons then? They're just I think totally... Wilson is the most accurate depiction. Oh, he's a caricature. Character. Oh, I see what you, you're saying. That's accurate in terms of the... the Wilson, uh... as, a, as a character, is the most accurate depiction mm. of, of, of attitudes and, and male, pers the way a man is of that time. With the mask off, the real man... And and then, the way he is. then the, there's the secondary character, another character that would that would fit that. The, there's two other. There's three characters really. The security guard at the gate, mm. right? Well, all the bit characters actually are are depictions that are not, you know, uh, exaggerated. But Wilson, while exaggerated, I think he represents because he's the most rounded. He sees we have more layers in, in who he is in the film, but I think the uh you know like the the bartender um you know mm. the the, yeah. the drunkard in inside all these little bit characters but i think the honest other than wilson is the taxi driver at the end of the film or yeah you know, and the bartender is another good one that just bartender's a another good average one. guy because he of... treats he doesn't treat uh, at later on when there's a conflict right with wilson in the bar the bartender takes Dowd's right word that that they're good guys, and he says, "If if 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 uh, Mr. Dowd vouches for you, then okay." Right. So even yeah. though he knows he knows uh, Elwood's kind of loopy, right? He treats him like a like a like respected a member of his yeah. of his you know patrons. He doesn't just say, "Look, I'm done with you. Get out." treats him with humanity and yeah. respect yeah i agree the bartender great character the taxi driver well there are a couple of them but one of the taxi drivers no one yes but you're right the kind of average joe characters those bit players do represent kind of a more realistic this is you're probably right these two characters are not the most realistic in the film she, those are those others are more so the nurse i'm not sure I forgot her what her name was, but the nurse yeah. herself, she's charming. She's yeah. charming, and she stands up for herself. She says things when she doesn't like the way they're going, right? Right. But, but what I didn't like about her was how how well or how quickly she fell in love with with uh, Elwood, and all Elwood needed to do was hold her hand and show her a little affection, show her a little bit of gentleness, and she fell in love with him in that moment but not like the love of you know romantic love but rather in love yeah. with his gentleness yes right his christ like they, it was it was definitely that christ-like nature there are moments when you see them both just watching elwood i think i might have a picture of it where they um let me see well here's the scene where they're all looking at him and they're looking at uh elwood's character in this kind of admiration way he's brought these people together he's he's right. he's healed them there's another scene where they're kind of in an alley or something and elwood is with the nurse and the doctor and he's yes. talking to them and he's in the light it's very christ-like and uh the other two are looking at him and he's like emanating this light from him shining yeah, on like their the faces sermon on the mount sermon on the mount yeah <laughs> uh he heals people he's a healer because of his because of his sincerity because of his sincerity he lives in the moment mm -hmm. that's that's the difference between because he he talks about this the character talks about this in one point one of my one of the the lines that i've really appreciated 
uh, in the film was when he says something about how he used to be. I haven't danced in a long while, he says, or something. He used to be very busy and very, I can't remember the exact phrasing in this moment, but he says something about he was before he was, he was always this one thing. And, and, or maybe Harvey said to him something, but he says, um, it can contrast the way he was before to the way he is now. And the phrasing was something about being pleasant. Yeah, that's my favorite line in the whole film that my friend was? would quote. Yeah, he said, uh, my brother used to say, one can be oh so smart or oh that's so pleasant. I found in my, I've tried being oh so smart and I found now that I prefer being pleasant. Yes. And that's so it. that's the difference between being smart and being pleasant. And he's decided consciously not to be smart, but to be pleasant. And that's made all, and that's made all the difference. Yeah. And uh, that's the, to me, that's the heart and soul of the whole film. Yes. He's, and it's almost this, I don't know if that's a Christ-like quality being pleasant, but probably it's almost kind of Buddhist in a way, you know, but just being pleasant and accepting of everything. Not judgmental. Yeah. Accepting of the moment right? mm -hmm. being present, right? Taking yeah. everyone at face value, not looking for hidden, for hidden, you know, agendas or, not assuming that just because someone pays you a compliment while standing in your nice house beside a grand piano that they're obviously interested in your money. So, you know, Wilson is a bad character. It's none of those kinds of assumptions. <laughs> he was bad. He was not pleasant. He was completely the most unpleasant person in the entire movie. Wilson. Which is again indicative of the time of his upbringing of his this social is an interesting moment in the in the show wasn't it what's that is this this was the unveiling of of harvey yeah and i i it's one of those movies i think as a kid when i saw it i know i saw it when i was very young i probably saw it on television when i was 10 mm. years old thereabouts and then i saw it again in my teens and I don't think I've seen it again since maybe my teens, but I always had the memory that you actually saw the rabbit at some point in the movie, like walking along or something. But you, the only thing you actually see is this, you see this painting. Uh, so it was yeah, kind of like the this. only representation of Harvey. Yeah. Right. In the film. In the film, except yeah. in the end, when there's a spiritual presence right a mystical presence that opens doors yeah yeah and rocks the rocking chair and all right. that stuff right a big white rabbit these are out of order i apologize a big white rabbit six feet high or is it six feet three and a half okay that's the moment you were talking about this is the moment i was talking about where the role reversal where elwood is the psychiatrist and the doctor is able to be the patient and reveal himself. Yeah. It's sort of like um, he finds someone who can listen to his problems. And that's how Elwood is so great. He's pleasant to everyone. He's yeah. pleasant to his oppressors. He's pleasant to his uh, underlings, people beneath him, social status wise. He's, he's pleasant with everyone. I like the position from a, from a visual standpoint. Right, um, um, Jimmy Stewart's posture in this in this scene, in this moment, mm -hmm. very loose and it's very um, relaxed. And yeah. right, the scene would not have worked if he'd adopted a more rigid posture of like a clinician who was, yeah. uh, you know, analyzing because it would have been a bit of a distraction from the moment and from the character. But yeah. Yeah, this is a nice, this was a nice moment. For yeah, him. it was a great, and great moment. And when Chum, he, Chumley smiles after this. Yeah. Right? He goes from a, from a character that hardly shows any kind of joy, um, only worry and anxiety, right? 
to a very relaxed and, and happy person. Healing, the healing power of Harvey. Another shot. Here's the taxi driver at the end. Great, who, uh, great characterization. Yeah, who basically says that, uh, you know, he drives them out there and they're as happy as can be. And when they, when they come back, they turn into, what does he say? When they come back, they turn into normal, perfectly normal human beings. And he goes, I, we all know what stinkers they are. That's right. So basically he's saying, if he takes that injection of, of 970, formula 977, he's going to turn into a perfectly normal human being. Yeah. And uh, perfectly Norman, normal human beings are pretty awful. <laughs> well, very selfish and very yeah. singularly, singularly focused. Right. Like the taxi driver, the perfectly normal taxi driver at the beginning of the movie, right? right. Somebody's a little strange. First thing he does is grabs a wrench. Yeah. Right. right. He thinks kill. he's certain he's going to bang someone upside the head. If you don't understand it, kill it. That's right. 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 So that's a great moment in the film where he convinces. And of course, all that clever stuff. I think I have a picture. All that clever stuff where Harvey hides the wallet so they can't pay the taxi driver. Yeah. So that they have to go and ask Elwood for the money. Yep. Harvey's pulling these strings throughout the entire, you know, movie to sort of direct, to maybe protect Elwood, you know, it's like his guardian angel. Yeah, there are so many wonderful little moments in the film and, mm -hmm. and anyone, who's, anyone who's never seen the film, they have to, you really should go and watch it. Yeah. Because it is a, it is a, it's a classic piece of American film history. Yeah. But it's just good film. It's just good. Yeah, it really is. It's a, it's a beautiful film. It's a very beautiful. There she is realizing Harvey. <laughs> Harvey did it. And that's, that's, if you stay, on, stay with, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. you know, that's one of the things that I've appreciated about the film from a, from a theatrical standpoint, from a creation standpoint. You've got a character. You've got all these actors that are that are accustomed to being on stage, and they're they're using a, they're not method actors like Marlon Brando and you know Al Pacino and and Dustin Hoffman and all these guys that came after Robert De Niro, yeah. all these classic you know guys from the seventies who borrowed from the earlier you know shifting of of acting methods. That rather than work on the inside, which is easy to do right because you have to find that um, in, emotional life on the inside if you're an actor and you're presenting in an intimate kind of uh, uh, format like yeah. uh, you know small theater productions or or film or television right so you have to find that inner emotional life but the acting of of vaudeville and stage that inner life is too small for the audience to see so they have to be very presentational. They have to be big and grandiose in their characterizations or in the representations of the emotions the character is feeling. So that outward facing acting style where you kind of block everything and you figure out what the, you know, how you're going to show your face and, you know, how you're going to represent anger or represent, yeah. you know, joy so that people can, who are like 80 feet from you in a live theater environment can see it and, and experience that emotional connection or that emotion, right? So in this film and other films that preceded it and, and a few films that, that, that came after, they still, the actors were still relying, these, these classic theater actors are still relying on this very presentational style, which on the big screen sometimes seems overblown Vita is an overblown character, right? Yeah. To her, yeah. everything she does is big. And I mean, it, it works. Oh, it works on the screen. I mean, right. It was it worked beautifully yeah, for this worked. particular film. It but really does. That style probably wouldn't suit um, a, 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 even something from the 60s or later, later yeah. 60s, 70s, definitely not the 80s, right? Where everything is much yeah. smaller and more internalized. Yeah. 
and and Wilson himself, right? That whole big grandiose kind of personality worked in this particular film because yeah. you know it was the character he was portraying. But yeah. the woodenness of it seemed like the the young doctor was trying to present an internal struggle, right? And he wasn't good enough as an actor to be able to do that mm -hmm. while portraying this 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 character. And what ended up happening is that you get this wooden kind of icky, bad acting kind of presence. So that's what I've, I what I really loved about this film was you could easily see how they use theatrical techniques for the characters, for the staging, and even for the filming. Because at some points, you even saw Jimmy Stewart walking past the camera and the shadow of the camera, right? Mm, uh, passing on his face in a couple mm. of these scenes when he mm. walks past, right? It's it's so it's so funny uh, when when you when you kind of see those moments for what they are. I didn't catch that. Well, this is the end of the film where he uh, Harvey is still there waiting on the bench for him, but he goes back in again. But they have their final discussion, and you get you see the swing moving. And they have their discussion and then Harvey decides to go and hang out with Dr. Chumley for a while. And Jimmy talks up to him and says, okay, do whatever you want. And then the doctor takes him in, but then later Harvey comes back and you see the door open, the gate open on its own. It's like the switch goes by itself and Harvey's decides to go with. Yeah with uh jimmy now do we think that harvey's did he really leave the doctor or does the doctor have his own harvey in there with him <laughs> his own guardian angel is harvey able to um be in two places at once the spirit he's like the father the son and the holy ghost or something you know it's like the holy ghost can be with me or with you right at any time well if if you are you, are you asking this is something we really want I mean, to talk about? I mean, I don't know. Do we feel that Harvey, do we think Dr. Chumley is sitting there going, oh, I wish Harvey was around? Or do we think Dr. Chumley is in there still talking to Harvey on his own? I think, I think um, as, as I think it was in that scene where Jimmy Stewart was talking to Dr. Chumley about time. Hmm. And he said that Harvey can, can take you in a, something about you can do all the things you want to do with anyone you want to do it and you come back in the exact not even a minute has passed mm. so you can do you can have that entire experience so not even a minute has passed in the film between when harvey goes in with chumley and he comes back out to dowd right to elwood right right, right. so i wonder if all the things that Dr. Chumley needed were accomplished. Maybe. Were done in that brief moment of time. And now he, he uh, came out to be with the person he preferred being with. Yeah. Because obviously Chumley wanted to do stuff for himself. Right? Right. And right, uh, Elwood said even then that he couldn't think of any other place he'd rather be. Right? That in that moment, so if Harvey was a spirit, whether he was a spirit or not, if he's a real character, right? Who do you want to hang out with? Someone who's asking you to do stuff to, for them all the time and make something possible? Or do you want to hang out with a guy that's not asking you for anything? Right. Just the pleasure of your company. Yeah. I, yeah. Think, I, think, that's, I think that's what happened at the end of the film. Yeah. And then they walk off into the sunset and uh, it seems like uh, Harvey is is with Jimmy, but I kind of I just kind of think that Doctor Chumley still has Harvey with him in some ways. Okay. I don't know why. Maybe I'm just reading into it. It's sort of like I think Harvey, in a way, is a kind of like a muse. It's this thing that inspires you, that leads you on. As a creative person, we need our muse. And okay. in a way, uh, Harvey is kind of like 
Jimmy Stewart's or Elwood's muse. I don't know. <laughs> let well, me go. Let me go to the. That's the nice thing about a movie like this. It leaves it open ended. Yeah, it does. It it, it never it. ties up everything, and that's what's nice. It's like so much is left un, you know, unresolved. Let's go to the uh, double screen here. We'll kind of finish off. This is a great film. It's a classic. I'm glad we got to talk about it. And I don't see the Marxism. I'll never see that. I don't think I'll. Well, Marxism I'll see the, is. The, the capitalist kind of kind of tropes you're talking about well marxism is just so interwoven in our in our world that you, you can't avoid it it's just there at present at present. yeah yeah i mean it's just there um if you believe if you subscribe to that belief system maybe you don't and that's fine but uh i think you could do it you can do a marxist marxist critique of almost any artwork really any film any piece of literature right basically apply that screen that filter and look through it through that lens i'm i'm looking forward to looking yeah. through looking at the next film through that lens with you <laughs> I'll, I'll try i'll do the best i can i'm I, not I, I think the very next film we should do we should look at it through a marxist lens okay i'm gonna pick a a, a film then that maybe it'll be easier for me to do that with i haven't thought of what film we should look at next but um it should be something that lends itself to that perhaps. Well, well, Parasite did, but we didn't really go into the Marxist dimensions of that. Right. Although I'm not well, a Marxist scholar by any stretch, but you know. Harvey is a, is a great film for, for anyone to watch. And um, as, as I said, it's not just a, a, a wonderful classic uh, film. Um, it's, it's great and entertaining and in and of itself, but yeah. it's a it's a great piece of American film history to see the transit. It's a transition. Um, it's a, from that transition period from very presentational types, right? Mm -hmm. The silent movies, which is also very very vaudevillian, very very um, presentational, uh, to a more internally focused. Um, storytelling or, or type of storytelling, very emotional um, um, uh, method kind of acting within within the the, the film. So uh, it's just beautifully done as just a piece of of historical representation of the of the time period, as well yes. as uh, that's just a piece of the film. So uh, yeah. people should watch it. I think. Very much. Yes, Harvey's a really worthwhile film with a great message. Everyone should, you know, embrace this film and be more pleasant. So, be less smart and more pleasant. Thank you for watching, everyone. Thanks, guys. Um, Bye. Thanks. Bye.